Hey, good morning, everyone. It's Pastor Bramick at Holy Shepherd Lutheran Church. Today is Monday. It's August the 19th. It's time for our daily devotion. We are in 2 Samuel chapter 11, a very famous chapter entitled David and Bathsheba. In the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all of his master's servants and did not go down to his house. When David was told Uriah did not go home, he asked him, Haven't you just come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, The ark and the Israel, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open fields. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants, and he did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, Put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah in a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men of in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messengers, when you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up. And he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city? Why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know that they would all shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jerub Bethsheth? Didn't a woman throw an upper millstone uh, around him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, Also, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. The messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had said to him. The messenger said to Joab, these men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance to the city gate. Then the archer shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant, Uriah the Hittite, is dead. David told the messenger, Say this to Joab, don't let this, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as the other. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. All right, so we, we know this story, and uh, David covets Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. He sends for her. He is intimate with her. She conceives, and at first, he it seems like he tries to set it up where... Uh, Joab would uh, also um, be intimate with her, and that this way, if a child was born, then it could be said that it was Uriah's son and not David's. This doesn't work because Uriah is so loyal to David that he will not even go home and see his own wife, even when David invites him back to Jerusalem. But he sleeps with, excuse me, the uh, the military men who are in his in his regiment or or that he associates with being a member of the Israelite army. So then David 
uh, hatches another plan where he's now going to have Uriah killed. And so David is guilty of murder. David is guilty of adultery. David is guilty of coveting and, and of doing all of these, these wicked things. And his plan works. Uriah is killed, and then he takes Bathsheba uh, for his wife, and uh, then she's going to bear a son. But the, the account ends by saying that this whole thing displeased the Lord, that, you know, you, you see throughout this, just like you did with Saul, that the people are very loyal to the king. The king is never questioned, um, except by the prophet Nathan, who we will, I believe, hear about tomorrow. But the king's men don't question him. His word is law. Whatever he says, the people do. They obey him without question, uh, without scrutiny. And, um, you know, as a result, the king, you know, I think can grow arrogant and can grow, um, you know, hardened to uh, the law of God. And that's what happens here with David. Now, David is talked about as being uh, a beloved king, Israel's most beloved king, the apple of God's eye, and so forth. And we may ask, well, how can that be with what he does here today? And, and the answer to that, of that I believe, is that, you know, despite the fact that, that David commits these grave sins, the one thing that he doesn't do that Solomon does and Saul does is that David does not break the first commandment. Um, David does not permit the worship of other gods. He does not allow other gods into the temple. He does not entertain fortune tellers or mediums, um, but, but he remains solely loyal to God um, in, in terms of the first commandment. And so for this reason, I believe that, that David acquires the status of being faithful to God and, and being beloved by God, and God makes a covenant with David. But we also see that no man is perfect, except for Jesus, right? David is without sin. Oh, I'm sorry. David is not without sin. And David will be made to face his sin um, very soon. And so I, I believe we will be hearing about that tomorrow and, and likely the rest of this week. We'll see what happens with David. But, um, you know, Jesus is the son of David who is without sin. Jesus is the only one who is without sin. And uh, he's the only one who can shed his blood to satisfy the father's, um, to satisfy the penalty for sin and to undergo the judgment of the father for all humanity. So this is a, a, an important distinction to make about Jesus, that even though Jesus is a son, a son of David, he's also the son of God and that he will not be subject to the same temptations and mistakes that David makes, but rather he will overcome such things and uh, be completely faithful to God, not just in the first commandment, but in all commandments. All right, let's continue now as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. All right, uh, announcements for today. So um, yesterday we had the Fellowship Hall and the Narthex polished. The floors polished because they're heavy traffic areas and um, the, the finish was getting dull. So we moved all the furniture out of those two rooms. We now could use some help moving it back. So if you have some time today or tomorrow, um, if you can come up to the church and help set up the fellowship hall tables and move the furniture back in the narthex, uh, two people would be great um, to do this. Uh, one person can certainly accomplish a lot, but uh, we would love to get this done in the next couple of days. So uh, you can uh, text me. Um, or you can respond to the uh, remind message that I sent out via text just a few moments ago. Um, let me know if you have time to do this, because I want to make sure that uh, you don't just come up to church and someone came up before you and got it done. So, so let me know. Uh, let's see. We do have Mahjong happening this coming Thursday at its usual time at 10 a.m. 
This coming Saturday, we have, uh, we're, we're looking to spread the mulch in the playground. And that's going to be at 8 a.m. We'd like for people to come. And uh, there's going to be an all-day grief share about surviving the loss of a spouse. That's going to be at 10 a.m. And Mary Visaggio is heading that up. So if you have any questions about any of these things, you can get back to me, Tom Wegener, who is our trustee for the mulch, um, or Mary Visaggio for the grief share event this Saturday. All right. And then um, Pastor David Leffler um, is being laid to rest today at Messiah Lutheran Church. This is going to be at 2 p.m. this afternoon. Um, pastor Leffler is the former pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Watauga. Um, and um, he was a pastor here in the area for many years. He's also the grandfather of our former organist, David Preston. So that, uh, that funeral service will be held at Messiah today at 2 p.m. And I will be participating in that. So... All right. God bless you. Thank you for watching our devotions, and I will see you tomorrow.